Greetings, Earthers, Martians, Belters, members of the OPA. Welcome to episode nine of Expanse, the unofficial podcast. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker, and joining me on the show today is Nikki Starwalker. Hey there. Hey, Nikki. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Isn't it great to be here? Yes. Again? (laughs) Someone uh, forgot to press record. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is this is take two for us. We just basically did the whole episode and realized that the recorder wasn't <laughs> going. <laughs> yeah, we're new with this. <laughs> so I shouldn't have to edit this at all because this is going to be perfect now because we had a, a rehearsal. Right. <laughs> So what did we talk about first last time? (laughs) So uh, we got a surprising and exciting (laughs) announcement uh, this week. At least it was new to me this week, which is the first four episodes of The Expanse are available right now for you to watch on Sci-Fi's website. Yeah, it's a really nice gift. Yeah, how cool is that? That's awesome. So um, we watched episode two last night and we watched it again (laughs) tonight (laughs) and we're going to talk about it. Yeah. So, um, Nikki, what did you think of the second episode? Well, the second episode was exciting and intense and I liked it for sure. Um, I will say that I don't think it was as exciting as the first one. Okay. Maybe that's appropriate. Maybe the first one has to be really over the top <laughs> to pull people in. <laughs> well, the first one did have the flip and burn. So it's kind of <laughs> hard to match that unless they did another flip and burn <laughs> this week, which would have been fine by me, by the way. <laughs> so every episode, we're going <laughs> to decide how good it is uh, based on whether or not it has flip and burn in it. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were going to suggest that every episode we have a flip and burn. <laughs> which I would be totally on board with. Um, And how we can keep that from getting old is every week it's a different ship doing the maneuver. I want (laughs) to see the Donager do a flip and burn. (laughs) Whoa, that would take a while. Actually, I just want to see the Donager, like the whole thing, like its whole profile. Yeah, we didn't get to in this one. Yeah. And that ship is the the ship that captures them at the very end of this episode. Yes, it's a Mars... uh, Navy ship. Ooh, scary. (laughs) Yeah. In the books, it's described basically as a skyscraper on its side. Wow. And it's that kind of uh, build where, you know, the engines would be like in the basement. Okay. So that, you know, you you have thrust gravity pulling you down and I see as it goes forward. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm I'm sure we're going to see it. Um, They're just teasing us, making us wait. I can't wait. Um, (laughs) Of course, there's another ship that I'm much more excited to see, but I I won't mention her tonight. (laughs) Soon. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Uh, That's all right. So not not quite as exciting as as the first episode. I'd I'd agree with that. Although, like you said, still very uh, tense. I like the tone and the pacing of this show. I like that it has suspense. I, I like the the suspense and the build and how this is more almost on the on the thriller side as far as like kind of the pacing and mm-hmm. kind of trying to get you towards the edge of that seat a little bit. Yeah, inching forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to start from the very beginning, um, we finally had our question answered when we were wondering about Holden and what he put in his coffee. Yeah, yeah. So quite a few people online were wondering about why he was grinding up a match head in his coffee. And, you know, we were talking about, well, there's sulfur in match heads and there's sulfur in coffee. So maybe, you know, (laughs) it's something to do with that. And I tweeted at James S.A. Corey asking, (laughs) And he gave this kind of cheeky, like, oh, you must think it tastes better that way, you know? <laughs> and then you were like, well, maybe, you know, they're going to reveal it and he didn't want to spoil it. And you were right. <laughs> so we finally got an answer, everybody, about why he's putting it in his coffee. Yeah. And it's all because of the navigator. I think her name is Ade. Yeah. Yeah. I liked her. I, I would have liked to seen more of her. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the tens- tension on the ship that you were talking about, it's it's quite different from the book. And I realize that we are now taking the show on its own and we're yes. going to compare and judge it by itself, yes. which is appropriate. And I just thought that um, the way that everybody was kind of at each other's throat on the ship and Holden and Naomi are really clashing and they're the leaders right now. And it, it kind of made the environment very unstable, not to mention the fact that they're fighting for survival almost every second on that ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's a shuttlecraft, right? I, I can't even really call it its own ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little ship. It's a tiny ship. <laughs> Well, if you remember, it, it wasn't like in the greatest ship shape to begin with because there was oh, a scene right. in the first episode where I think Holden was asking Naomi about it, like she'd done a, you know, a check on it or whatever. And, and she was basically like, you know, I wouldn't take it very far, but <laughs> it's all right for short little trips. So I, I think she said you can't take it in an atmosphere. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I kind of wonder because because I was wondering about the whole uh, hatch or the airlock blowing open, um, and I wonder now. I just thought of that. Um, now I want to go watch the first episode again. If that's somehow tied into that malfunction that she was talking about, that was why they couldn't go in an atmosphere. Oh. Um, because I did think that was really odd, um, and and the first time we watched it, I was like, what? When the uh, they're going through the debris field and, and something like hits the ship and uh, knocks like basically the outer doors of the airlock off. And for some reason, the inner doors just open. Mm-hmm. And the first time I was like, what the fuck was that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, the second time, like we actually I like stopped it and backed it up because I'm like, oh, wait, I want to watch this because I got to see what's going on here. And, you know, there's obviously malfunctions happening and electrical shorts and whatnot. So, okay. But it still, like, doesn't really make sense to me, like, why a a spaceship, when it took damage, the hatch would open. Right. (laughs) (laughs) It seems like, if anything, it would lock down and you wouldn't be able to open it because they would want it to be closed. Mm Mm-hmm. But now I'm wondering, because now I just remembered, you know, that they did mention in the first episode some kind of malfunction that was going on that they couldn't fix. And so now I'm wondering maybe it's connected to that. So I'm really curious. i got to go check that out. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Or just wait for someone to email me. I'm sure someone will email me and and tell me all about it. Right. (laughs) (laughs) They're typing the email now. (laughs) At least wait till the episode's over. (laughs) (laughs) We might figure it out. (laughs) Yeah, it's always funny when someone emails you and it's obvious that they are they're emailing you regarding something you said in the beginning of a podcast. Uh-huh. <laughs> and what they say in the email you actually address later in the podcast. <laughs> right. And it's like, okay, obviously you didn't listen to the whole thing. You like stopped and emailed me <laughs> because I actually said that like 10 minutes later, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> they had to get it out. <laughs> that's right. I, I've been there. I've been there. So, um, yeah, and, and speaking of that scene, um, you know, last week we, we were really talking quite a bit about the visual effects, uh, which are awesome, you know, with the flip and burn and everything. Not that that was the only one. It's just the one that really, really hit me. Um, <laughs> but we, we got so carried away that we forgot about the sound effects, uh, which are really cool, too. And one thing that I really liked in that scene was, you know, when they're flying through the debris field, just the sound effects they used for the debris hitting the hull. Mm -hmm. And it was this very like metal on metal, steel on steel sound that just like really made it real for me and not like this fake space opery, like magic and unicorns in space kind of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And also um, another part that I noticed where where the sound effects were really nice, nicely done was with the gravity boots and, you know, the little sounds they make when they engage and disengage from whatever they're magnetized to. And, you know, obvious stuff like people walking across the room and stuff. But even like, you know, there's one part where like Holden just kind of shifts his weight, you know, and, mm-hmm. and they even got those sounds in there and got the timing like like just right. 
you know, because something like that, like we know human behavior really well. And it's something like that. If you got it even just a fraction of a second off, like we would notice and we might not be like, oh, that sound effect was off, but we'd just be like, that didn't seem right. Like that seemed really fake or hokey or something. Yeah. So I, I just uh, really noticed that kind of stuff in this episode. And I think the first episode, I was just so wowed by the visual stuff that I kind of like I noticed it, but I didn't really it didn't really stick out because I was so excited about the flip and burn. Yeah. And <laughs> it, it's just one of those things that um, really good sound effects can be easily ignored um, ignored is not the right word, but not noticed basically right. because it's just so natural. And unless you're really paying attention like we are because we're doing a podcast, right. uh, you can miss like that really genius uh, sound work and the music, um, the way that they use music in t- different TV shows. So yeah, I agree with you. It, it was very well done here and things just felt like they... They sounded like they have weight to them. Um, I liked like all the the visual effects too, though, were cool in this episode. Did you catch that when they turned off the gravity? Naomi comes over to Alex's screen and shuts down the engines, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's boots lock. Yeah. And in the background, things are floating around them. (laughs) Yeah. So little touches here and there are really nice and make it more realistic. Or like when I think it was Miller was pouring some kind of drink and it's like kind of going sideways because of the, uh, oh, what do they call it? Coriolis effect or something like that from the spin yeah. of, of series. Yeah. Um, you know, something you said reminded me of something. I saw someone online somewhere uh, criticizing the show because they had sound in space, you know, and everybody knows there's, there's no sound in space. Um, and I think this person was even saying something about, uh, the show being hard sci-fi, which actually kind of, I kind of giggle inside every time I see, cause I've seen a lot of people say that. And, and a lot of people seem to be thinking that the show is, is trying or supposed to be hard sci-fi and it's not. It's space opera. Right. But it's just that we are so used to things like Star Wars and Star Trek, which is more, much more fantasy in space than science fiction, especially Star Wars. But, you know, we're just used to like that level of space opera where it's like so far beyond like mundane science fiction that when we see something like this, it's more, you know, more mundane science fiction it seems like hard sci-fi to people because it's at least somewhat, you know, plausible. It's not like, you know, transporters and time travel and <laughs> all this stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of that's that's really interesting. I, I think we could do a whole show just on that and what that could mean and what that could say about us as a society. Um, but anyway, I. You know, and kind of my response to that was that, yeah, there's no sound in space, but how boring would the show be if there was no sound in space? You know, I mean, it's entertainment first and foremost before Mm -hmm. it's a science lesson, you know, and I think it's more important that it be an entertaining show than everything be scientifically accurate, you know, but, you know, that said, I noticed watching uh the second episode again today that i i don't think they're ignoring that you know when they are when we have the scene of holden and uh amos out trying to fix the antenna on the night and they're out in vacuum we're hearing sounds but Mm -hmm. the way that they're doing the sounds a lot of what we're hearing are either their voices over the radio, which they would hear because they have atmosphere in their suits, or you're hearing sounds like through the ship, like Mm -hmm. sounds of like knocking on the hull of the ship and stuff like that. You're not really hearing that many, like like you're not hearing any environmental sounds or anything like that. So, So it's actually not exactly, but it's, you know, artistically very similar you know, in feel and showing that kind of alienness and how it, well, it's not like you're just standing out in the park talking to each other, you know, you're in space and, you know, 
there's only sound in your suit and there's not sound outside of your suit. Now, obviously, you know, if we have like a, a space battle or something, there's going to be sound just because it, it'd be boring as hell without it, unless it was a very fast scene, you know? Right. But I, you know, I don't think that the people making the show are ignorant of the fact that there is not space and sound. And I think as they're able to, you know, as they're able to and have it like make a good story and, and further the story instead of just, oh, we're doing this thing to be scientifically accurate, even though it's going to annoy the shit out of you. You know, yeah. they do it whenever they can and however they can, which, you know. Works for me. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I'm laughing because you said there's no space and sound. <laughs> <laughs> that too. There is there is only space and sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if it needs sound to be engaging, then by all means use sound. You know, I'm watching yeah. it to have fun and to really get into it and be on the edge of my seat. So You, you know what it actually reminded me of is some of the those sounds when they were out in space – um, with the ship is it reminded me of like sounds you'd hear in like a submarine movie Oh, and the sounds yeah. of like the, the hull like settling to the pressure and, and stuff like, like how you hear the sounds transmitted through the ship. Like it, it was very similar. And, and I'd be curious if, you know, if they use similar, you know, techniques, um, because, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I did a, I did a, like an ambient starship sound mm -hmm. and, you know, the way I actually did it was I took ocean sounds, um, sounds like underwater, like real underwater sounds and just mixed them together and played them at different speeds and pitches and stuff. But, oh, cool. But it was based on sounds of the ocean and it sounded very much like, you know, you're on the enterprise, like from next generation or something. So I, I would speculate that other starship sounds that we've heard kind of more high fantasy space opera stuff is, is probably underwater stuff too, which kind of makes sense. Cause there's a lot of similarities between like a submarine vessel and a, a space vessel. So. Yeah, definitely. And those kind of sounds can bring um, more interest to the scene because you're reminded of the dangers of being out in space. Yeah. Just like if you were in a submarine and surrounded by right. water. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I really wanted to mention. You know, we were just talking about the the scene where they're fixing the antenna and, you know, they had to evacuate all the air in the ship and everybody had to be in there hard vacuum suits and everything. And I really like that because it did convey that sense of we're in space. It's super dangerous. If one little thing goes wrong, we're all fucked that you never get in star Wars or star Trek. I have watched every episode of any kind of star Trek that exists. And not once did I ever feel that sense of danger of we're in space and this is an environment completely inhospitable <laughs> to human life. Yeah, no. They're like lounging on their couches and <laughs> yeah. having counseling sessions. I, I think the closest to that I ever experienced in anything Star Trek was um, on Enterprise, which is a very, very much underrated show, I think. Should be appreciated more. But anyway, yeah, I agree. There, there's a scene where Hoshi, who was, you know, not super comfortable with being in space yet, um, was in engineering and was talking to the captain. And he's like standing right by the warp core. And she just kind of offhand, she's like, are you sure it's safe to stand so close to that? Yeah. You know, and, and that one line conveyed all of the sense of danger in space that I ever got. <laughs> from, from star from star trek ever <laughs> wow <laughs> which wasn't a whole lot you know that was one character who was really out of her element at that moment but right um but yeah you know that those scenes were were really cool and i i like that kind of attention to realism and trying to make it more like we're watching something like gravity or interstellar and less like we're watching star trek yeah you know yeah but for no there was not a moment in there that I sat there expecting hard sci-fi. Um, no. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm sure if we got a couple physicists on the show that that they could walk us through like the just left and right things that are just wrong, you know. <laughs> but um, 
I feel sorry for those guys. I hope they can still enjoy shows like this yeah. and they're not just like, oh, there's too many scientific inaccuracies. I can't get into this. <laughs> Another thing um, that I thought was really cool that was a sense of, a little dose of realism that, that you often don't see in any type of show. And this is something that you can see in any show like your cop drama, courtroom drama, whatever, okay. is um, when I believe it was, yeah, Holden, Shed goes out. And Holden's like doing chest compressions and Shed comes back and he's like, what did you do to me? And he's yeah. like, you know, because usually when you give CP, someone CPR, you actually break their ribs. Oh, wow. And yeah, someone that, that came out of that would be in, in a lot of pain. And how many times have you seen someone give or receive CPR on a TV show? And how many times when the person came out of it? Did they say anything about their chest hurting because they'd gotten CPR? Like, I can't think of one. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like that too. And at first I didn't get it because I'm so used to right, right. <laughs> the way that it's usually done on television. So uh, the second time we watched it, I picked up and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's actually really cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of like in the, the 80s how... And even the 90s, I think, and, and maybe even today in really bad shows, how people didn't seem to understand how, how like brain damage works and, and people would be getting knocked upside the head with hard objects all the time to knock them out. And then they'd wake up and be totally fine afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those were the days. One other part that I really loved on the ship before we leave the ship, when they were out fixing the ship, Holden and Amos, and Alex was running out of air. He was humming and singing, and I yeah. believe that's part of his character now because we've seen him hum multiple times. He was um, kind of going in and out, I think kind of fading, mm -hmm. and he was humming Sweet Clementine. I can't yeah. remember the name of the song. Okay. Yeah. And the way they, they were panning through the ship, it made it very creepy yeah. with his humming. Yeah. And I really like that. It was kind of a, a nice horror element. Cass, if you were going for creepy, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other great lines in there for all the characters. But especially Cass, he just really felt like Alex to me. Yeah, so he's, I liked it a yeah, lot. I, I, I was really <laughs> loving him in the, this episode. I, I hope he had a lot of fun with it because he did a great job. Me too. You know, one thing that, that I really liked uh, in this episode was how they started showing us how the, the two stories are related and, and kind of, I think, hopefully for those that don't know anything about the story, you know, overall, uh, letting you know that that these stories are going to begin to intertwine more, and it's not a show about two completely unrelated things <laughs> happening in different places. Right. And you know, so so they did that by, you know, when we're on series, we hear uh, news reports about the Canterbury in the background, and they had this great thing running through the episode with the water shortages and how. Um, because the Canterbury was destroyed, there's like one or two shipments of water to Ceres that are either late or maybe not coming. And because of that, you know, people are getting worried. People are starting to have conspiracy theories or thinking that there's going to be big trouble. Um, prices of water are going up. And we have this scene with <laughs> Miller in the shower. And I liked how they, they showed his uh, prosthetic, you know, well, he doesn't have a prosthetic, but they, they showed his, <laughs> his spinal malformation or whatever to, mm -hmm. you know, show he's a belter, which, which was cool. And, and I dig how they have like, you know, belters have various uh, physiological differences. It's not like they're all the same, you know, different ways that they've uh, changed because of living in zero G, but he's in the shower and he's suds up his hair and he like runs out of water. Like everybody has a certain amount of water they get and he's used his up and it's gone. He can't rinse his hair, you know? <laughs> and then later in the episode, we see him at Julie Mao's apartment and he's rinsing his hair in her sink because, you know, she's a rich girl. So of course she's got plenty of water <laughs> paid for. 
And uh, it was hilarious. It, it was just really funny. Um, it showed us something about Miller. Mm -hmm. And it also, you know, showed us the effect of this thing happening with Holden and them, you know, with the, the loss of the Canterbury and how already that's affecting life here far, far away. I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it is. And it's making the situation even worse on series. So we'll have to see where that goes. Yeah. But I liked Julie Mao's apartment. Yeah, that was cool. Did you notice the three locks on the door? No, I didn't notice that. <laughs> Makes sense, though. So. Yeah, because, you know, we learned that she is kind of a badass. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe she's had trouble in the past. Um, maybe she's paranoid, but for whatever reason, she has three locks on the door and you go in and it's pretty small and cramped apartments. Um, and then they, they play the video between her and her dad. Yeah. But I really like the mouse over the video screen. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. <laughs> the frozen mouse. And then he comes to life <laughs> and his eye turns red. <laughs> he wasn't really frozen. Frozen <laughs> makes it sound like, like someone put him in, in a freezer or something. I know. In a block of ice. I know. He's probably robotic. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my theory. Like. Like he had some kind of motion sensor and sense movement. And so he started doing his little thing, like some kind of little toy or like people that have the fish on their wall that sings like it's the future space mouse version of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good theory. <laughs> you know, one thing I, I really liked uh, in that bit where Miller was investigating her apartment was how he was able to use his little pad um, and speak into it and it would speak in her voice and he was able to bypass her security and access her computer files that way. I, I thought that was really cool. Um, I don't remember that from, from the books. I, I don't think that's quite how he did it in the book, but it was a great way to kind of visually show him being a detective and kind of show how, you know, he's doing the same kind of thing that a detective would do today or would have done 20 years ago, but he's just got these cool new gadgets to help him and, Totally right. made sense. I really liked it. So let's talk about Ava Sarala for, okay. for a minute here. She got called out on torturing that belter that she had. Yeah. So now he's in a tank yeah. with water and she was talking to him and he had this tattoo on his chest and it kind of looked like a hummingbird, but the tail okay. looked like a fish tail. So I didn't get a really great look at it, but that was interesting. Did you notice that all the belters seem to have tattoos around their neck? Yeah, I did notice the the neck tattoos. Um, those are those are kind of odd. I, I would never tattoo something like that on my neck. It, it just seems like you're you're showing somewhere like where they would put the blade if they want to cut your head off. You know, it's like <laughs> here I drew a line for you. It'd be like getting a tattoo of a bullseye over your heart. It's just like it just seems like you're tempting fate to do that. <laughs> It's just me, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> well, this is uh, just a crazy theory. But what if it's because, I mean, of course, it's to say I'm a belter. But it says that by being exactly where the injection site would be if they're sitting in the chair. Uh huh. So maybe that's kind of emulating that to say that they live out in space and they're always getting these injections or they're always flying. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Um but, I mean, it's really only people on the spaceships that get those injections, I think. So okay. if you're just someone living on a station. What would it mean? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it means you're a pilot. I don't know. Yeah, I don't maybe, know. Maybe it's something like you don't see the needle tracks from all those injections because of the tattoo. <laughs> but that's that's interesting. I didn't make the connection that it's in the same area. Yeah, Naomi has the same similar neck tattoo. Uh, so you were talking about a Vasarala? Yes, um, and I was talking about her because I was talking about the tattoos. Um, I really liked how she was sitting in that meeting eating pistachios. Like it was nothing. Yeah, I'd forgotten a about the pistachios. I thought um, she was eating those uh, pills that they take for interrogations. Oh. But yeah, you're right. She was she was big in the pistachios. So I'm sure that's what it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Throwing the shells over her shoulder. Was she? I didn't yeah. catch that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was definitely pistachios then. Awesome. <laughs> well, uh, I guess that's pretty much what we have to say 
about the second episode. I think that, did we cover everything that we said in the first take? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> this may seem like a, a short episode to you, but to us, it seems twice as long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, I'm not sure why. <laughs> So, so yeah, so we've got the first four episodes available online. So if you want to go watch them on sci-fi.com, you can watch all four now. Um, and then the third and fourth episodes will be coming out in the next two weeks on, on TV. So next week we'll talk about episode three. Sweet. So until then, conserve your oxygen and your water. Resources are precious in the outer solar system. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Flip and burn, baby. Flip and burn.